Hello, everybody. My name is Mai, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Pavia in Italy, and a member of the VPHI Student Committee. I am very pleased to welcome you to this uh, VPHI keynote webinar. So our speaker today is Dr. Radomir Chabigno, currently at the UT Southwestern Medical Center, Dallas. Today, his presentation is an overview of the results achieved in a clinical model in collaboration between INRIA France and UTSW Medical Center Dallas on the tetralogy of follow and modeling of diseases. So Radomir, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mike, for a kind introduction. Thank you to the organizers of the, of the webinar for giving me a chance to give this talk. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on the time zone. So in next hour or so, we will be discussing, I hope it will be also discussing about uh, how to translate cardiovascular models into clinical healthcare to be directly beneficial to patients. So first I will start by introducing translation cardiovascular modeling, and then I will illustrate some examples, how models can contribute into the assessment of heart function, and also how they can contribute in uh, in assisting in intervention. This will be demonstrated on one congenital heart disease, the tetralogy of follow. So first, translational cardiovascular modeling, TCM abbreviation. I think if this abbreviation came from David Nosleton when we were writing the, the review paper, cited below. So this is a translation of biophysical and mathematical modeling to the problems of cardiovascular medicine. So intrinsically, it's a multidisciplinary approach, which brings the opportunity to address clinical problems that are not sufficiently solved by current clinical techniques. So translational cardiovascular modeling contributes to diagnosis, for example, by some novel or more reliable uh, bioindicators, biomarkers markers, uh, for patient stratification, or it can contribute even to optimal clinical management thanks to predictive capabilities of the models that have a biophysical or physiological base. So what are the components of translation of school modeling? So first is the model. So the model is physiologically and biophysically based. Second is patient's data. Number three is the mean, how the data can speak to the models. So basically kind of generic models are then turned into personalized models or patient-specific models. And number four is really translation of these patient-specific models into patients' healthcare. So this webinar is going to be about uh, translation of the patient-specific modeling into the uh, patient healthcare. So to achieve number four, the conditions one, two, and three, so model, data and coupling of model data are necessary condition, but not sufficient. So we need uh, something more. And the goal of this webinar will be to discuss uh, how, to, uh, how to contribute actually to succeeding in this translation. So first let's go into this. Um, uh, how the model can contribute into the assessment of heart function. So in particular, uh, the, the, the assessment of heart failure and even in particular, early stage heart failure. So what do we mean by heart failure? It's a syndrome when heart is not able to pump sufficient amount of blood to cover the metabolic needs of peripheral tissues. Uh, the symptoms of, of heart failure are uh, dyspnea, angina pain, fatigue, palpitation, et cetera. The, the heart failure can be uh, classified by New York Heart Association classification for classes. Uh, let's say number one and two would be like early stage heart failure when patient is still comfortable at rest, but the, with the symptoms of heart failure at, the, at some stress, exercise, day, physical activity, going down to uh, the number four, class four, when the symptoms of heart failure may be present even at, at rest. So why is it interesting actually to, to talk even about the heart failure? It's because it's a big problem, yeah? Because the five-year survival, once heart failure is diagnosed, is only around um, less than 50%. So how to make this, uh, how to increase this number? 
So one way could be that we may think about moving, shifting the diagnosis from this like late, later stages to the early stages, to, to move to the early stage heart failure. So early stage heart failure. So there are, we said that at rest, the, there are no symptoms, but there are already some changes in the heart that can be uh, tackled, for example, by some uh, special imaging techniques like magnetic resonance imaging, uh, tissue characterization of the relaxation time, for example, or directly using directly using VPH techniques of modeling uh, by estimation of the tissue stiffness, myocardial tissue stiffness. Uh, what's important in early stage heart failure would be the assessment of of uh, myocardial perfusion as uh, an early sign of uh, of, of, of heart failure or some machine pattern, either in kinematics or dynamics. So this is what we look at now a little bit in detail. So by kinematics, we mean that we will be mostly step one looking on the how the how the heart moves. Right? Uh, so here is an example of uh, cine. Uh, of CINI MRI, uh, four channel view, left ventricle, right ventricle. If you cut it in such slices, you get the short axis view of the heart covering the heart from the apex to the base. And we can see directly here that once the heart contracts, you can see that on the left ventricle, it somehow it slightly rotates anticlockwise here. And if you move to the base, it rotates like slightly clockwise. So there is like a twist of the of the left ventricle that we can see. The question is whether this twist is preserved even in early stage heart failure. So to, to tackle this twist, we need some way of extracting motion from the images. For this, we use the method developed by Park and Genet from uh, Echo Polytechnic and in the Grant which is based on image registration constrained by a biophysical model. And then we analyzed health volunteers in which we saw that indeed there is anticlockwise uh, atrial rotation and clockwise base rotation, so there's a twist in the left ventricle. And when we look on some patients in early stage heart failure, we saw that there is like this twist is either uh, like, like disappearing or even reversing. So this was actually an, one example of the translation of, of a method that's uh, constrained by the model. So it's translation of cardiovascular modeling into a clinical problem. So this example, if you look like on the a landscape of this particular translational cardiovascular modeling problem, is started by a clinical problem by a clinical team at UT Southwestern Medical Center Dallas. Then they talk to Echo Polytechnic in their France, where they, 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 there was a method to, uh, to address this problem. Then this method was adapted and directly implemented actually on the site at UT Southwestern by other partners, Czech Technical University. And in the end, there was like uh, around 100 patients analyzed. So here we can see one key point in the translational cardiovascular modeling that it requests a relevant clinical question or questions, addressing them and interpreting the answers. So somehow the interpretation of the, of the answer can be like created. Maybe the question was not good enough, not what, what was a stupid question, for example. But even this would lead like this interaction leads to like uh, every step is a learning point that in the end we can get, uh, generate a new question that other, by addressing this question we can move step by step towards something clinically really useful so this was like number one when looking on the heart function we just look on the motion pattern now we can think about what actually are the forces or stresses generated by the myocardium? So we'll look more deeply on the ventricle mechanics. So 
again, we stay in the in early stage heart failure. So if we want to assess early stage heart failure, we said nothing happens at, at, at rest. It, it's normal function. So we need somehow a uh, patient to make to, to exercise, yeah, and we do it. So patient can do exercise on the on the bike, treadmill. The bike can be even uh, the patient can cycle even in the in the magnet in the MRI, which is of course more tricky. So quite often we replace the exercise, the physiological exercise, by some pharmacological stimulation that makes the heart contract like like it's exercising. Uh, and here I will show one example that uh, was made at uh, uh, King's College London when we had a group of patients, quite special patients with single ventricle with exercise intolerance, so early stage heart failure. So this is quite common that single ventricle patients, they do develop throughout the time um, uh, the, the exercise intolerance. And we are asking what's the main cause of their early stage heart failure. Because you can imagine it can be on the side of the uh, of the um, uh, uh, of the myocardium that myocardium is, is is weak and is not able to uh, develop sufficient stress active stress. It can be in the periphery in the increased resistance of the periphery in increased afterload, or it can be actually a limited payload limited venous return. Uh, and in each individual patient with exercise intolerance, we actually don't know what's the main cause. So we did like a quite uh, detailed uh, clinical examination that consisted of the magnetic resonance imaging at rest. You can see here the contracting heart. And at stress, the stress was not exercise, it was by this uh, uh, drug that makes the heart uh, contracting like as exercise. So the vitamin stress. And we can see that the heart contracts faster and stronger. So even more, this is really quite, uh, the, the decision about the patient was quite important. Uh, what will be the, the next step in their clinical management? Therefore, actually the non-invasive, this was even a combined procedure of a non-invasive MRI and invasive pressure measurements by catheter. So we had at baseline also the pressures measured in the ventricle and the, in the large vessels and the same at, um, at, the, at the, the butamine stress. So now with all this like, data, this rich data set, we are still asking the same question. So what's the main cause of the early stage heart failure in, in a given patient? And sometimes we actually we don't, still don't know, we don't see it from the data. So how to, the way how to synthesize the data to, to get it to one uh, unique picture, as we know in PH, to be to use a model. So we can create a patient specific model that uh, interacts with the data, with the image data, with the pressure data. And such a model can first can uh, capture the motion pattern, point A, but also it can generate the, the pressures in the cavity. Here we can see that the uh, simulated data in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the cavity at the baseline, in solid line, are very close to the, uh, to the, to the measured pressures in this line, both baseline and uh, the, the, the vitamin stress. And of course, in addition, the model gives us uh, some uh, material characteristic or, or, or physiological properties of the, of the heart in this case, uh, which can be the contractility, so the maximum active stress developed by the myocardium at rest, and how it increases at, at stress, at, at exercise. So we can see it in this patient, it actually doubled or nearly tripled. So that's, uh, that's good. This, this is called, this is so-called contractile reserve. So we would say that uh, this patient has a good contractile reserve. And of course, model can provide us with other, uh, like, a view angles, the other other type of physiological parameters like resistance of the in the circulation or uh, parameters of the really of the preloading of the venous return, uh, bicardial stiffness, etc. Okay, so based on such big, rich data set, we created patient-specific model. Um, we can think about it. Actually, such a, a patient-specific model was quite 
computation intensive. It was a 3D model. Um, and maybe we, uh, our main question was, what's the contractile reserve? How, whether the heart is able to increase sufficiently the contractility at stress. And maybe we don't need really a distribution of the, of the contractility throughout the myocardium. Maybe we need some kind of one average value of contractility. So therefore, we may uh, simplify our geometry from a detailed geometry of the patient to a sphere, sphere of, of, of the size corresponding to the heart of the, of the patient, with the wall thickness corresponding to the wall thickness of the patient, such as did the metric parallel, parallel in this paper at INREA. So this model reduction, so we are reducing the geometry and kinematics, but we keep the physics exactly as it was uh, in the 3D. And we can see that actually such a simplified model can still generate uh, the pressures uh, as, as, the, as, as in the measurement. So again, the simulator is the solid line, the line is the, uh, is, the, is the data, baseline blue is the, the vitamin stress, volume of the ventricle and flow in aorta. So if we compare with our period with the 3D, it's, it's very similar. Um, and the, 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 I just to illustrate a little bit, I, I simulated two cycles in 0D and only one cycle in 3D, just to say that, of course, with 0D, we have a gain in, in, in time. Computation time is much uh, lower. So this particular model uh, to run maybe one or two cycles, we, are, we may need like maybe five seconds of computational time. In the 3D case, uh, we would be rather somewhere on five hours, even worse. To set up a zero D model, uh, it would take us maybe five minutes. But if we need to set up a three D model, that's uh, even uh, it's rather days, maybe five days, really to create a very detailed uh, patient uh, geometry mesh, uh, uh, polish the mesh, and so on. Okay, so now we go back. We go back to our program. We had our patient at King's College London that we made the MRI at rest and stress with the catheter. And uh, we were, so we were assessing the contractility of the myocardium. And we can see that at rest, the black bars, contractilities are quite homogeneous. So that's not surprising because it's an early stage heart failure. And in early stage, uh, nothing happens. Yeah, so the function is normal. On the other hand, we can see that some patient when when and infusing the vitamin, they increase the contractility of these patients. So we can say that this patient had a, a preserved contractile reserve. On the, on the other hand, these patients are still in early stage heart failure. So we would say that these patients, uh, the cause of their early stage heart failure is not on the myocardial side, but will be rather either on the atrop or the preload or something different even. Uh, this patient didn't have uh, sufficient contractile reserve. So we can say that very likely in these patients, the limited contractile reserve was one component of the early stage heart failure. Okay, so this was another example of translating cardiac models into, into clinical healthcare. We can look on, on the, this kind of TCM, translational cardio, cardiovascular modeling landscape that this project started at uh, King's College London in the hospital, St. Thomas' at Everina's Children's Hospital. And the, the, the modeling method came from a modeling team at Indria France. Then, of course, such modeling method uh, may be not directly fine-tuned to the a given type of patient. So, of course, there, was, there had to be interaction between Indria and King's College on, uh, like I would I call it here, physiologic fine-tuning or even with other partners like UT Southwestern. And in the end, we had a tool that was applied to the patients to, um, to assess the contractile reserve at KCL, at King's College, but so they can be used elsewhere. So here, I would like to highlight one uh, key point in the translation of cardiac modeling, that it, it indeed it requests strong coupling with, between clinical and modeling teams. 
So strong coupling, I mean, in really kind of in mathematical sense, yeah, that uh, uh, clinical team team speaks to uh, modeling team and modeling team listens to, to the clinicians and vice versa, modeling team speaks to the clinical team and the clinical team listens to, uh, to the modelers. Okay, so that would be two illustrations about model augmented assessment of heart function. Uh, now I would introduce what, uh, what is uh, tetralogy of follow. So first of all, normal heart. Normal heart is of left, left ventricle. Left ventricle is pumping blood through aorta into the systemic circulation. And right ventricle is pumping blood through pulmonary artery into the pulmonary circulation. So during embryology phase, something wrong can happen, uh, ending in the in this in the picture of tetralogy of follow. Let's say it has four components: ventricle septal defect, so the hole between uh, between the two ventricles, the uh, stenosed or narrower pulmonary artery, and actually uh, like a wider aorta. In this case, overriding the both left and right ventricle, and when it's a compensatory hypertrophy of right ventricle. So this picture is, 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 is tetralogy of follow, and it's it's a common congenital heart disease. It's like seven to ten percent of all congenital heart diseases, and it would lead uh, to death in infancy if nothing is done. If if uh, if it stayed like this, but tetralogy of follow is actually like a really success story of pediatric, pediatric cardiology because. Uh, uh, Thanks to like, like surgery, complete uh, surgical repair, the patients have actually normal life, ex pretty much normal life expectancy. So the the surgery repair consists of the closing the VSD, but ventricular septal defect, and enlarging the the pulmonary artery. Of course, so it's a real success story. Uh, the technology you follow, but there are some conse consequences that for which the repaired the pa patients with repaired technology you follow needs to be followed. Uh, so when enlarging the pulmonary artery, typically the valve is somehow disrupted and it, it, it's insufficient, it, it's, it's leaking. Also, uh, some in right ventricle outflow tract, there may still remain some residual stenosis. So first leads to volume overload. That means if the valve is leaking, here we have a, a, a picture of the, of the uh, CINI MRI, again, magnetic resonance imaging image. Uh, this is right ventricle, right ventricle outflow tract, pulmonary artery. Here would be the valve, and we can see that in the relaxation is like a jet of flow backwards. So this is uh, this is the pulmonary valve, valve regurgitation, and you can imagine that if, for example, 30, 40, 50, and 50 percent of blood returns back after the contraction, with the heart, the right ventricle needs to pump 50 percent more blood in total. So it's volume overloaded, which uh, which leads into the dilatation uh, remodeling of the right ventricle in the sense of the dilatation uh, likewise residual stenosis leads actually to pressure overload of the right ventricle uh, both can lead into um, into the into heart failure basically due to this chronic overloading there are some associated defects in the in the technology follow so quite common is that there is some narrowing of the branch pulmonary arteries that needs to be somehow intervened on. Uh, uh, it's very often common that there are some electrophysiology issues as well. So in fact, the third year follow, uh, we can see that we look into translational cardiovascular modeling. Here we can translate a number of models actually, uh, because we have, we, uh, with the third follow, repair the third year follow, we have a number of questions like, uh, what, what's the optimal timing for the pulmonary valve replacement, uh, or whether to intervene on branch pulmonary artery, uh, narrow branch pulmonary artery, optimal management of the electrophysiology uh, disorders, or preventing the right or left sided heart failure. So here we will look mostly on the on the first item, optimal timing on pul pulmonary valve replacement. Uh, so. Clinically, when we have a patient with a chronic pulmonary regurgitation uh, and remodeled dilated right ventricle, so we assess the patient by, by measuring what's actually the regurgitation fraction. 
what's the amount of blood that returns back to the right ventricle. If it's, uh, you see, uh, like uh, more than 40, uh, that would be moderate, more than 50 severe pulmonary regurgitation, then this leads, as I said, to remodeling to the dilatation of right ventricle up to like a, a severe dilatation when the, the, the right ventricle volume at end diastole is more than 150 milliliters per square meter of body surface area. Uh, and we need to decide, so when is the right time to really intervene on the valve so that it's not too early. If, if, it, if we are basically too much on the left side, we would probably wait. If we are too much on the right side, we would probably intervene. The patient that's, that's here on this, on this picture, uh, it's more, it's, it's quite on the right, severe pulmonary irritation, severe uh, RV dilatation, but only mild reduction of the adjacent fraction. Uh, so the, the point about optimal timing of PVR, time pulmonary valve replacement, is that even like we would like, of course, we would like the dilated right ventricle to reverse the mandel back to normal size, to normalize in size. Unfortunately, in uh, like this happens only, this reverse manner happens only in 60% uh, of patients uh, using any clinical criteria that exist. Uh, so this patient was, this, this is a success uh, case when uh, the, the right ventricle uh, decreased in size after the pulmonary valve replacement. But we are thinking about, so how to maybe increase this number so, so that we can predict uh, or, or maybe to, to intervene earlier, uh, not to lose the possibility of this reverse modeling. Uh, it's quite a mechanical problem, right? We have a, a, a volume over the ventricle, uh, valve that's insufficient, so we can uh, try to include the mechanics. So here it's a, this is actually a project of Maya Kuseva working on her PhD at INRIA and with UT Southwestern Medical Center. So Maria took 20 patients with uh, referred to Georgia follow uh, data set, and she took a model developed at, uh, at INRIA. She synthesized the data into the models. So she created these patient-specific models. You can see that uh, Maria's models are pretty again, are very uh, close to the to the to the to the to the, simulate, to the, to the data simulation solid um, data uh, baseline. And such models, what, what, what do they tell us? So Maria discovered that actually, if we look on the RV, right ventricle contractility, so how, what type of force the right ventricle needs to uh, create during the contraction, uh, normally we would be somewhere in this corner here, but this was in all patients, it was, uh, increased in some much more increased, but pretty much all had uh, increased contractility. So these are these um, colored uh, circles. The empty circles are then the situation after the pulmonary valve replacement. So you can see that typically after PVR, the contractility went down and it even uh, nearly normalized in some patients. So what I would like to say in this in my study, we can see that the uh, the models directly doesn't predict when to intervene, but it already gives us some better insight into the physiology and pathophysiology, what's happening in this chronically overloaded ventricle and what happens immediately after the, uh, the, the, the intervention. So here, the landscape again of the translation is, we start from, again, okay, some clinical centers, UT Southwestern or the uh, medical school at uh, Dell Medical School in Austin. We have a model, modeling team at INRIA. Then it's creating the patient specific models. So this is a quite interesting part because this, you can say that this is a job of, of the modeling team. But on the other hand, if, if the model is already kind of established and uh, it can uh, be kind of a, even part of a package like a black box, it can be directly, maybe handled directly in the uh, clinical team. And then we have uh, uh, interpretation, which is more on the side of the, on, on, the, on the clinical side. Of course, feedbacking back uh, to the modeling team, uh, because this circle again uh, can uh, further de develop. So here I would like to raise one important point of the translational cardiac modeling that 
most problems that we are solving are actually rather big and uh, they do request joining efforts. So this is a fun example of how we can join efforts uh, to address big problems. DVR is, can be actually viewed also from other angles. So already we looked at it from the clinical viewpoint when we measured the volume, uh, volumes and the regurgitation and so on. Uh, then from mechanics, measuring, uh, looking for estimating the contractility, uh, the group of Alistair Young at King's College London uh, is actually looking on the shape, uh, shape of the right and left ventricles. And in the, 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 uh, before and after primary uh, uh, replacement, and we can see that in this project, Alistair actually had to put together even like, like quite a big number of actors here: yeah? King's College, Auckland, uh, San Diego, Singapore, Dallas, and so on. Saying just once more, these problems are rather big and require joining efforts. So with this list of uh, participants, it's even bigger, this message. But there is maybe also uh, like a second message crystallizing in this, that we are, in this example, we are looking on pulmonary valve replacement, and we already tackled it by uh, clinics, mechanics, now statistical shape modeling, maybe we can look also on the flow and so on. So in uh, some problems like this, possibly, combining various modeling approaches in a collaborative way may have, have the potential really to advance the clinical outcomes. Okay, so now we use the model to, to contribute into the to planning of the, of the clinical management of the patient, of pulmonary valve replacement. Now let's, the patient goes for the, for the replacement, goes for the surgery, for example, and we are asking, can the model somehow um, contribute also during uh, during surgery. Uh, okay, so during general anesthesia, particularly for patients with increased cardiovascular risk, uh, the, the anesthetists they do the, the, the monitoring, monitoring of the cardiovascular system. It can contain uh, measuring continuous measurement of the pressures in the periphery uh, circulation, maybe continuous measurement of the cardiac output that would be the green waveform here. And sometimes we can see the increased pressure, decrease of the flow. We can ask it, so what's happening here. So here, that's in this part, that was actually the injection of the bolus of norepinephrine, so vasoactive drug. And we can ask, okay, so we inject vasoactive drug, norepinephrine, and we see that the pressure goes up, the flow goes down. But what's actually with the physiology of the patient? Can we say something more about how can we interpret this continuous record somehow more to, to augment this our physiological view of the of the patient? Well, we know that we probably can couple the data with the model, and that's the project of Arthur Legal, who is the uh, who is PhD student at, at India, but also anesthetist in La Boise Hospital in Paris, and Arthur took uh, patients, his patients. Uh, that were undergoing general anesthesia. Pre-surgery pre or pre-intervention, he took the 2D echo. Uh, and then during the intervention, he had this monitoring of the pressure and of the flow, flow in aorta, and uh, calibrated the, 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 or he calibrated the models or created the patient-specific models, these numerical avatars. And when like doing some statistics about on this, uh, uh, numerical avatars, uh, so that in, in a group of 45 patients, he was uh, quite close to the data. So by uh, having such digital twins, we are actually accessing something more than just measurement of the pressure and flow. We are accessing uh, uh, actually properties even of the heart. We can access the PV loop of the ventricle, which we can use to uh, some detailed cardiac bioenergetics assessment, for instance. Uh, then once more, so actually when we created his, his models, then uh, in some, some patients, the, 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 the noradrenaline, norepinephrine, the same, was administered. And before we only saw this part that the pressure went up and the flow went down, but 
the, the patient-specific model gives us something more. It augments our view of the patient. The, the, the solid PG was before administering the, the noradrenaline and the dash is after. So we can see how, how it changes. And this can be furthermore, um, uh, what, furthermore, thanks to the model, we access some physiological properties directly, like the resistance on the, of the circulation. Here we can see that after, in average, after noradrenaline nor uh, bolus, it increased by 60%. And the myocardial contractility, which increased by, by 14%. So this work of Arthur is actually to for concept of uh, model augmented monitoring for general anesthesia and possibly also at intensive care unit. So once more, we go and we look on what was the this translational cardiovascular modeling landscape of this project. And we saw that there, there was a paper, okay, a clinical question coming from Lariboise Hospital, from, from anesthetist in Paris. Modeling method, again, from India. Then uh, there uh, always, when uh, nothing is so straightforward, we need to, uh, for example, in this case, we really needed some special type of experiments that we didn't have directly at hand, but fortunately we had our collaborators at King's College at, at UP Southwestern, thanks to whom we actually were able to, uh, to perform validations. And then it was the application, application to the patients in Laribo as the hospital and possibly elsewhere. So what can be the like, key point of the translation paradigm modeling uh, coming from this project? I would say, let's put the paper on the side and let's look on uh, disclose Arthur's, so Arthur Legal, we said he is the PhD student at, at Imria. Uh, he is anesthetist at the uh, uh, library hospital, but maybe, maybe you can find that he is part of some company like Rossum's University Robot, head of the physiological department. Uh, by this, I would like to uh, say that possibly another thing to consider, of course, in translating cardiovascular models to clinic is the commercialization. Uh, I think this about this company, we can also think about some ethical aspect, but this we can um, discuss. Okay, to now to, to discuss. So we wanted to uh, discuss about, about the translational cardiovascular modeling. We took one particular disease, it was a congenital heart disease that tells you follow. And we saw that actually some Existing techniques that exist in the, that we had the cardiac, in the cardiac modeling community could be adapted to the technology of follow. That's a one point. But the second point, quite particular a cohort of the technology of follow of patients who are regularly followed, followed up uh, can lead to some new methods that would that could be translated then uh, to to let's say to cardiology in general, even to acquire heart diseases, to, let's say to much bigger cohort of patients. So an example, some examples on this scheme. So if we are able to plan better pulmonary valve replacement in pulmonary uh, valve insufficiency, it follows. Maybe this, uh, this skill can help us also in uh, better plan the uh, aortic valve interventions, which is, by the way, much bigger cohort of uh, patients. Likewise, if we understand better the, the left or right ventricle failure in follows, maybe we will also better understand the heart failure uh, in general. Uh, from the other side, we can say, okay, if we uh, can, for example, uh, predict uh, or better treat some dyssynchronic issues or to optimize the cardiac rest synchronization therapy in uh, heart failure in acquired heart diseases, maybe this can help us on the, uh, the other end in uh, the technology of follow. And so we started from like a small cohort disease and we are connecting it actually with general cardiology disease. So we, we can ask, is there any other example that we could use? Um, in current world, actually we can look on a, this is a new disease, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, MISC, you might have heard about. So this 
this is related to to, to corona coronavirus SARS-CoV-2, but it's not the the same disease as we see uh, typically the COVID-19 disease. But this is a disease that affects children two for two to four weeks after the exposure to the virus. It's kind of aberrant reaction of their immune system, and uh, typically 80% of these children have uh, cardiovascular involvement and they stay, uh, they 80% of them also get into intensive care unit, cardiovascular shock and heart failure. So the question is, so it's, it's a rare disease, but it's a severe disease. And maybe we can like, in, what we did in the talk to follow, maybe we can take some existing modeling works and uh, try to apply in this, uh, for this patient and maybe they benefit from it. So here we can take directly the work of Arthur Legal from his company and, uh, and, and, and try to apply and uh, to do and retranslate to the ICU. So in other, other way, what can we do? So if we, if we are good, if we do something good for the MIC patient, either in acute stage, so acute stage is the ICU, is typically this ICU monitoring. So probably this, if we are able to do something in ICU monitoring for MISC, most likely we will be then able to also apply this in uh, complex cases at ICU in general, like in cardiogenic shock, uh, toxic shock, uh, not only for children with, uh, with this um, multi-system inflammatory syndrome. Uh, there is a, uh, also, the, so this is like the acute problem. The long-term problem in MISC is that we need to follow up the patients because we don't know what happened with their heart and cardiovascular system after they, they return, they are discharged from the hospital. So of course they come after two months, six months, uh, and we need to somehow decide whether the heart function, but there are some long-term consequences. Because if we are able to objectively assess this uh, long-term uh, evolution of the, of the heart in the patients with MISC, that would be, of course, that's a, that's a key in cardiology because cardiology patients are coming for six, six months, two years and so on, and we need to see whether there is any progress in their disease. Uh, if you are interested in, in MISC, so I would like to invite you to join our special session at, uh, that we organized with uh, Tarek Hussain at uh, Functional Imaging and Modeling of Heart Conference. Uh, this year, so unfortunately, this is not going to be like it's organized uh, by Stanford, but it's online only for the reason of the coronavirus. Uh, and yeah, if I make this a good meeting, so so definitely good to join. So to conclude, in this talk, I wanted to show some points that uh, in the translational cardiovascular modeling, how to uh, increase our chances to succeed really in translating them to the patient uh, benefit to the healthcare. So number one was the trans translational cardiovascular modeling request. Relevant clinical questions, addressing them, interpreting the answers, and then getting new questions, yeah? Like looping this, uh, looping this. Um... Number two, TCM request, strong coupling between clinical and modeling teams. Number three, the problems that we are solving, solving are typically rather big and request to rejoining our efforts. Number four, in, uh, in many problems, uh, we can use various approaches, modeling approaches, for instance. And if we manage to put them together in a collaborative way, maybe that will have better potential to, to advance uh, the clinical ad 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 outcomes. Number five, commercialization may be the way to accelerate the translational cardiovascular model. So with this, uh, I will be happy to answer your question now, but me together with uh, Tarek Hussain, head of the pediatric card, cardiac MRI at UT Southwestern Medical, uh, Medical Center, we are happy to answer, answer the questions by, by email. Don't hesitate to, to, to ask us. In particular, uh, currently, if you are interested in this type of research, we have uh, some postdoc fundings available right now. So just to hesitate to email us. I would like to uh, like uh, thank to 
many collaborators that are involved in this uh, in this presentation in this uh, in this research. Uh, as my friend said, sometimes it's uh, good, better to be lucky than good. So I was really lucky with so many great people working, uh, and uh, I, I hope that I will think them in person soon. That it will be possible. And uh, thank you for your attention. I'm happy. I'm ready for your questions. So thank you very much, Radomir. It was a really nice and interesting presentation. So I'll just remind briefly, uh, if you have any question, you can write it down in the question box or either um, raise your hand to the application. So actually, I see one question. Um, so how do you address the challenge of personalization, given the large number of parameters and the limitation for getting internal variables without being too invasive? So uh, in the uh, in in this presentation, we were actually quite invasive, right? Because we had the invasive uh, data. So the uh, next step might be really uh, to connect to, to 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 become okay. So in some parts, we were quite invasive in PVR Feynman River uh, replacement or in the problem uh, of the of the, the vitamin stressing and and uh, combined catheter and MRI. You could see that when we are getting better and better in modeling, maybe we can reduce already the invasiveness. We saw it in this uh, general anesthesia setup where we actually uh, had just the, the, the information from the periphery circulation, which can be kind of mainly invasive or non-invasive. So one way is uh, to be better in the modeling, we can get actually to models that uh, will rely on non-invasive information. Uh, number two, I think where the field will go is, uh, of course, I didn't talk about at all about uh, like more statistical approaches or the uh, or the like the artificial intelligence, if uh, which can probably play a big role in. Um, uh, parametrizing the models, right? Uh, that we can maybe create our cohort in silico cohort, uh, and then this can uh, contribute in our maybe initial guess of the uh, of the parameters in our uh, numerical avatar. Does it answer somehow? Yeah, this is Nat who asked that question. Thank you so much. Um, I'll follow up with your with your papers and uh, perhaps you know, connect with you on LinkedIn because we're doing something similar with Children's Hospital Philadelphia. So I'm very, very interested in connect. Thank you. Thank you. So we have another question. So you said that the commercialization is the key. So it's the key point. So how do we engage the industry in a strategic way? So uh, uh, the... <laughs> The short answer is, I don't know. Yeah, we are working on it. Uh, uh, that's, uh, I guess, uh, at this stage, uh, we still need to like, uh, yeah, it's it's more. We are more in the stage that these are. Uh, there is not a direct selling product, I would say, for big industry. So what I see most likely is that we do it yeah, as, 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 as in many fields, like currently, via a small type of startup companies trying to sell this or to, 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 to show this show idea, like in, in academia, making a small startup, which then can develop into something bigger. That's in most cases, that's probably the way to go because uh, uh, I can imagine that for the big players in the industry, uh, the type of translation that I showed is probably too big risk uh, to go directly. I don't know what if is there any other uh, maybe somebody comment will comment on this. Yeah, we can discuss. Actually, we have a hand raised. Uh, from uh, Leon Axel, so mm -hmm. now he should be able to talk. 
Oh, lovely, lovely talk right here. Thank you. Uh, just a, a brief observation. Uh, it's interesting that you showed <clears throat> the ability of a very simplified balloon type heart to uh, capture some of the interesting features. And it's sort of like the old uh, Einstein's version of Occam Fraser that uh, things should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. When you have things like right bundle branch block or RV outflow packed uh, bundles obstructing flows, then you'll have to have more localized and, and individual kinds of uh, features incorporated in the model. So if you're you know, just sort of globally providing a pressurized blood, that may be good enough to look at a balloon. But when you try to look at some more detailed interactions of RV and LV and things like that, then I think you'll have to have a more detailed model capturing more of the individual features of the structural and functional differences. But uh, it's important to point out that you don't have to make it more complicated than it needs to be, depending on the specific question you're trying to address. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Leon, for your for comment. I agree uh, that definitely it's uh, uh, the, the yeah we are using the way as, as we know yeah when we use the models we try to use the simplest models to ask to address the question. So if if the question is some kind of a global view, for example, of the contractility and and, and contractility address stress contractor reserve, then the the balloon type of model uh, can be uh, adequate. In a way, and it can be uh, fast. That can can translate this uh, into use in the hospital directly. On the other hand, if uh, as you, as you pointed out, if we need to include a detailed spatial uh, heterogeneity, for example, of the contractility, like the infarcted heart, or we want we need to tackle in early stage heart failure some perfusion defect, which is also like localized. Uh, or the, uh, the the electrophysiological RBPB you mentioned, then I, yeah, I agree that uh, we need to uh, use more comp complex models. Uh, but of course, we can go from the the, 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 the very complex 3D. Uh, but in some cases, something even in between can be can be can be a good trade-off. Yeah, but that's a, that's what we are working on, like all of us, I think. Thank you for the comment. Uh, we also have here Jeremy. Yes, that's me. Hi, Radomir. We've met in Magdeburg. I am the heart surgeon who is doing the simulations myself. And I am lucky to work in one of those interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary groups, which was now created in Magdeburg. And I want to warn you about one thing. I'm terribly sorry to say that. Because when you want to sell something into medicine, it immediately triggers the problem of the, li of the legal responsibility and legal uh, liability. And this is the trickiest part in the commercialization of those, of those systems, of those ideas. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to be blamed for the let's say, mistake or misconception, which is woven in it. So I am so I'm, I'm, I'm very glad. Well, it was a beautiful presentation and, uh, and it is absolutely perfect because the timing is crucial in those, in those diseases which you have presented. And in general, in heart surgery, timing is very crucial and that would be perfect help. But you have to be very careful not to take responsibility for the decision. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for your comment. And uh, of course, we uh, even as, as this presentation was structured, and, and I think the whole uh, DTH community is is um, uh, it's more about all the time contributing to the to the decision, contributing into the uh, clinical management. But in the end, of course, yeah, the responsibility is on you on the cardiac on the surgeon or on the cardiologist to, uh, to really to decide about whether the surgery is uh, taking place. But I think that uh, maybe a little by a little, uh, we will be more and more moving into, because of course, when, when you, before you do the surgery, you discuss with, the, with your cardiologist and there is a dialogue, what, uh, what's the best for the patient. And uh, then, of course, taking into account the the, 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 the clinical exams, the images, or the, maybe the, radio, the radiologist, and so on and so forth. And uh, the, this uh, physiological and modeling viewpoint may be 
part of this uh, of this discussion like uh, in in the next next year i would say and that's uh, that would be i think that would be good and that could, could be helpful but uh, yeah as you said it's a uh, um, I would be delighted to participate in this discussion. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, I, I look forward to, to meeting you again. Actually, we met in Magdeburg, yes. So, uh, uh, yeah, hopefully it, 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 it will go in this direction. Thank you so much. We still have one question from uh, Tariq. So, stents are common in tetralogy. Uh, how do you deal with uh, MRI and stent artifacts degrading the MRI flow data? Okay. <laughs> yeah, we, we showed you the stand, uh, uh, that the, it's quite uh, common that the, the fallows, the project flow patient have the, uh, the stenosis of the, uh, of the pulmonary, uh, of branch pulmonary artery. Uh, we uh, can maybe, uh, we, uh, we, yeah, we, of course. So, so for this, it would be more on the side. Actually, have a, we have a, a, a slide here. Yeah, uh, we. So that's that's probably what Tarek is asking about. I have uh, a stent, stent in the palm, branch pulmonary artery here, and I don't see inside. And uh, we need to decide whether the it's what whether there is like a restenosis. Even more, it would be on the, in here on the. Aortic qualification. I think the last two webinars were actually given by Alberto Figueroa and by Cristobal Bertogro. Both of them were discussing the problems of the flow. Uh, so one way is, of course, to connect the data uh, and, and try to uh, the missing data, which would be in this case the geometry, to replace by a model. So to constrain a model, in this case, the model of flow, so that could be, for example, we have here the other collaboration uh, project where we do similar do, do, do flow measurement, uh, trying to use the, yeah, it can be a number of, of type of models. And uh, if, if the models are able to represent the, uh, the MRI, then possibly we can use them to, uh, we can use them to, to get Invert the model and to get some some knowledge about the possible stenosis. Does it answer the, the question somehow? Well, let's see if uh, Tarek has some something to say uh, more. Uh, I have a question from my side if I I still have time. So, which are in your opinion right now the the next issues is that should be addressed first at this stage of the of the work? I mean, what are your priority in uh, now? Uh, so I think I I, I think that uh, somehow yeah I basically I can go back to the, to this uh, to this yeah we have these five points. Uh, what's what I feel is really important? Uh, yeah, whoever is doing some translation uh, translation cardiac modeling. Is doing one, yeah, because uh, we don't usually we cannot like the models don't if, if they don't get questioned directly from clinicians, uh, it's it's a limited likelihood that that question would be really the thing that's really needed, yeah. Uh, everybody so needs a strong coupling between clinical and modeling teams. Uh, we know that the problems are big, and uh, so so we are collaborating on a given problem. I think that the really next step is. Uh, to uh, to combine uh, the, the the different viewpoints that different groups are doing. Yeah. So the technology of follow is was actually taken as an example that somebody can be uh, trying to predict the or optimize the pulmonary valve replacement using mechanical models. Somebody can use electromechanical models. Somebody can do statistical shape modeling. And if we put all those together. I think this this may be the, uh, the 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 next step because we know that uh, nobody in each sh shelf, let's say, we cannot uh, really say what's the best thing for the patient. But maybe if we put out uh, the, the, the efforts together, and then then it, 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 
it will be better. And it can be, yeah. Then is a question how to combine this uh, these methods in uh, in some under some umbrella, whether it should be like a, a model above the models or some uh, some uh, again neural network above the models. That's that's other thing. So that that would be this. And and of course as yeah as as we said and as Jeremy commented, uh, the commercialization is 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 the the, the very important uh, thing that's uh, that we need to think about. That's it. Uh, okay, right. Okay. Yes, thanks. There, there's there's so much work to do. So good luck for everything. <laughs> <laughs> good luck to all of us. Yeah, I think that's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I I don't think that there are any other questions. I I don't see any other raised hand or questions in the box. So again, thank you very much, Radomir, for the presentation, and thank you all for attending the webinar. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for uh, all the participants for participating. And have a good uh, day, evening. Yes. Oh, you too. <laughs>